Hi, I am delighted to be able to welcome Stan Stevens. I just want to say a few words just to introduce him. Stan is a, he's a lecturer in geographer, a senior lecturer in geography in the Department of Geosciences at the University of Massachusetts. Stan's work has involved collaborative research with indigenous peoples on issues in, in well, indigenous land use, commons governance, management, their conservation values and practices, and their struggles for sovereignty and self-determination. Stan has a PhD in geography from the University of California in Berkeley. His research integrates approaches from political ecology, cultural ecology, and environmental history. He's worked with indigenous people in Nepal since the 1980s, particularly the Sharwa uh, people in Kambu National Park. And uh, some of this work was published, uh, some of his work on Sharwa cultural and political ecology was published in his book, Claiming the High Ground, Sherpa's Subsistence and Environmental Change in the Highest Himalaya that was published in 1993 by the University of California Press. Stan has edited two more recent books on indigenous people in protected areas. This one, Indigenous Peoples, National Parks and Protected Areas, A New Paradigm link Linking Conservation, Culture and Rights, which was published last year by the University of Arizona Press. Um, and there's an earlier book, Conservation Through Cultural Survival, Indigenous Peoples and Protected Areas, which was published in 1997 by Island Press. All my graduate students know them very well, these books. <laughs> um, but beyond this, beyond this research, Stan has been a tireless advocate and um, activist promoting rights-based conservation and protected areas reform. Um, this work includes his participation in the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the IUCN, where for many years he served as a member of the Commission for Environmental, Economic and Social Policy, and he's also served on the World um, Commission on Protected Areas. Since, 19, uh, sorry, since 2010, he's been a steering committee member and officer of the Global ICCA Consortium, so that's the Indigenous Community and Conservation Areas Consortium which uh, includes um, over 80 indigenous people's organizations, different community organizations and NGOs, all working um, to support um, the recognition of indigenous territories and areas. Um, and that will be a, a, a major focus of the paper we're just about to hear. So it stands, um, keynote address is on rethinking protected areas, opportunities for indigenous peoples, and support of research, advocacy, and activism. So I am delighted to have Stan here, and uh, we're very fortunate that he could make it, and uh, I'll hand over to him. Thanks, Stan. Well, let's see. I think we're good. Okay, well thanks very much Monica for that introduction and thanks also to Monica and Colin for the invitation to come here and uh, join with you at this uh, very important gathering. I want to begin by acknowledging and paying respects to the people of this land, the Atacamec Nation, and to their elders past and present and I appreciate Grand Chief Constant Awashi's welcome to us and the opportunity to gather here in your people's territory. So tonight I'd like to share with you some observations about the remarkable change in conservation thinking and protected area policies and practices over the past decade or so. A transformation that fundamentally changes how national parks and other protected areas can be conceptualized, created, and governed. This creates important new opportunities for indigenous peoples, including recognition and respect for territory and rights, and redress for past and continuing injustices. 
So I want to try to do four things tonight. First, I want to give a quick overview of the recent changes in international policy about protected areas in indigenous peoples. Second, I want to do a kind of whirlwind tour of the world to talk briefly about a number of different types of new kinds of protected areas that reflect this change in thinking. Third, I want to highlight some of the international initiatives to increase the implementation of this new approach. And particularly, I want to make some reference to things that were raised last year at the World Parks Congress in Sydney, Australia. And then finally, I'd like to share a few thoughts about research, advocacy, and activism. OK. So protected areas have become central to global biodiversity conservation efforts. And the ways in which they have become envisioned, established, and governed have major significance for many indigenous peoples worldwide. With the proliferation of protected areas in recent years, there are now more than 200,000 administering a total area the size of Africa. These affect the lives of many indigenous peoples as most of the protected areas outside of Europe are established in indigenous peoples' territories, usually without their free prior and informed consent. Protected areas have often been a threat to indigenous peoples because of the attitudes and assumptions that many have been based on. Most of the world's protected areas have been established on understandings of so-called fortress conservation, the old protection paradigm, which has several key principles that are extremely problematic for indigenous peoples. Um, these exclusionary protected areas are typically established and governed by states or by other non-indigenous governments. They're assumed to be uninhabited with no subsistence or commercial land or marine use. It's assumed that coercive force can be used to create these conditions and construct uninhabited wildernesses. It's assumed that military and other armed units should carry out enforcement and guard borders. And it's assumed that there should be no recognition of territory or rights, no participation in governance, no benefits, no compensation for physical or economic displacement. Um, the United States uh, sort of got this model going a long time ago with that that historic photo from Yosemite uh, kind of is indicative of the attitudes and assumptions that we brought to early national park uh, establishment and governance in the United States. But one of the things to remember about fortress conservation is, although you'll hear a lot tonight about new policies, that fortress conservation continues to be very significant in many parts of the world. There are new protected areas being created based on these principles in Africa and in Asia. There are protected areas that have long been paper parks where the laws that were on the books, the national laws that were on the books that called for exclusion, um, were never enforced, but they are beginning to be enforced. So um, there's very much a continuing problem with, with fortress conservation thinking in the world today. And there's the problem that many of the protected areas that were established <clears throat> based on these principles have not been reformed. Okay, as many of you know, in the 1980s and 90s, there was the beginning of a, a reaction to fortress conservation, an attempt to think about different ways of doing conservation. So we had community-based conservation. We had community-based natural resource management. We had integrated conservation and development projects. But um, many of these initiatives failed to address the problem of fortress conservation and protected areas themselves. They tended to be directed at communities living outside of protected areas, oftentimes in buffer zones. They tended to focus on economic benefits, in, including uh, trying to promote alternative economic uh, regimes that increased people's integration with regional and global market economy. They tended to avoid words like governance and rights and restitution of land and recognition of customary collective tenure and customary law. So they didn't do very much, for the most part, to reform protected areas that were based on fortress conservation models. And that went even for some of the highest profile of all the protected areas established during this era, like Annapurna Conservation Area in Nepal. Sure, Annapurna Conservation Area in Nepal was different from many of the other protected areas that had been established in that country before. 
um, there were people living inside the protected areas they hadn't been evicted. People were still able to manage community forests and community grazing lands. The army wasn't in charge of enforcement. The local people were in charge of enforcement, but there was no participation by the communities in the governance of the protected area. Many customary land uses that were critical to subsistence and culture were banned uh, without their consent. Uh, there was no discussion of rights. So it was hardly a transformation of protected area thinking in the kind of terms that we think of today. In the 1990s, though, some other things began to happen. I'm going to highlight two of them. One was that IUCN uh, changed its definition of protected areas, and this created new spaces to envision new kinds of protected areas. So if you look at the bottom of that definition, it talks about protected areas being managed through legal or other effective means. That other effective means open the door to protected areas governed through customary institutions and customary law. It made possible protected areas governed or co-governed by indigenous peoples. And the other thing that happened in the 1990s happened in Montreal. IUCN holds World Conservation Congresses now every four years. The first of them was held in 1996 in Montreal. That Montreal World Conservation Congress adopted a number of policies on indigenous peoples. One of them addressed indigenous peoples in protected areas. Uh, I, don't know if you, I don't know if you can read the small print here, but one of the important things is that basically IUCN through this policy called on all of the various uh, partners and components and members of IUCN to develop a clear policy which did something very different, which, that, which was to put rights-based conservation at the heart of thinking about protected areas so that we had to start thinking about recognizing land rights, about making agreements prior to the establishment of protected areas, and about recognizing rights to participate in governance. So <clears throat> Montreal set the stage for a kind of a change in thinking about protected areas that uh, was taken much farther a few years later in 2003 in Durban, South Africa. IUCN convenes, IUCN is the International Union for Conservation of Nature, the world's largest conservation network. Government agencies are members, conservation NGOs are members. Um, they have commissions in which scientists and, and now also human rights advocates can be members of and they get together on various occasions to talk about policy and the kind of policy that's developed in IUCN circles is very influential in that it affects, among other things, uh, the decisions made by the parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity. So more on that later, but the point is, is that IUCN convenes a meeting every 10 years or so about protected areas, about national parks and protected areas. The one in 2003 was extremely significant. It was the first time at which at a World Parks Congress, indigenous peoples were present in large numbers. It was the first time indigenous peoples organized prior to a World Parks uh, Congress. It was the first time indigenous peoples came in with an agenda and came in determined to change policy, came in with a statement to read on the first day of the World Parks Congress as a declaration of the World Park Congress to give a heads up to international conservation that maybe the conversation needed to be different. And here's a couple of passages from that declaration. And as you can see, it's pretty powerful. The Declaration of Protected Areas and Indigenous Territories without our consent and engagement has resulted in our dispossession and resettlement, the violation of our rights, the displacement of our peoples, the loss of our sacred sites, and the slow but continuous loss of our cultures, as well as impoverishment. First, we were dispossessed in the name of kings and emperors, later in the name of state development, and now in the name of conservation. But this declaration, very importantly, went on to call not for doing away with protected areas, but for reforming protected areas and envisioning different kinds of protected areas. It called for rights-based conservation and protected areas grounded in indigenous peoples' knowledge and practices. So IUCN responded to this challenge. 
And Durban may have been a watershed moment in conservation history because of the policies that were adopted there. The outcome document, the Durban Accord, spoke of this as a new paradigm of protected areas and, and included statements such as the ones you see here. The first one um, urging the commitment of indigenous peoples and local communities. And by the way, it's worth noting that many of the IUCN policies don't refer only to indigenous peoples. They refer to local communities as well. There are some that are specifically focused on indigenous peoples and draw on the rights affirmed in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. But many of the other policies apply also to local communities. And second, that protected areas share benefits. And third, that Protected areas recognize, strengthen, protect, and support community conservation areas, what we're now calling ICCAs internationally. Uh, more on that in a few minutes. The Durban Action Plan uh, the Congress also adopted the Durban Action Plan, which is a set of 10 major desired outcomes with a number of time-specific targets. This was the first time IUCN and the World Conservation Congress had committed to any kind of a timetable where they outlined specific goals with time-specific targets, most of which have not been met. Um, but that's an, another question we're going to come to. Outcome five shown here was particularly important in advancing the new paradigm. It calls for the rights of indigenous peoples, including mobile indigenous peoples and local communities, are to be secured in relation to natural resources and biodiversity conservation. And it set up three targets. Uh, the first one called for securing rights and making clear that this applies in all protected areas, existing protected areas and not just new protected areas, which many countries might have preferred. Main target nine stressed that the governance structures of protected areas must include representatives chosen by indigenous peoples and local communities proportionate to their rights and interests. So when you have a protected area established on the territory of an indigenous peoples, their rights and interests involved in that protected area are great indeed. And main target 10, maybe the most controversial of all of them, calls for restitution of lands that were incorporated into protected areas without free prior and informed consent. In the years past Durban, uh, IUCN has put into place a whole set of policies and programs that embody the new paradigm, among them the initiatives shown here. If we had about a week to look at this, we could uh, get into the policies in depth, but uh, believe me, they've been expanded and, um, uh, and developed over the past decade. The new paradigm has also been adopted to some degree by the state parties to the Convention on Biological Diversities and Decisions of the CBD and its program of work on protected areas. So as many of you know, the CBD is an international treaty. It's the treaty that uh, is most engaged with protected areas. And as a treaty, its provisions are considered to have greater weight than IUCN policies with ratifying states. And ratifying states here include all the members of the United Nations except the USA. So you can see here that this is a, uh, one of the technical reports of the CBD, so published by the Secretariat of the CBD in Montreal, and written by members of the ICCA consortium about ICCAs, about indigenous peoples and community conserved territories and areas, uh, and launched at a, a conference of the parties of the CBD by the uh, Secretary of the CBD in a special event. So the CBD has become to strongly support ICCAs. It's maybe worth saying a couple words about ICCAs now because there's a, it's a relatively new term. There's a fair amount of confusion about it, in part because it's being used in different ways uh, internationally. So first of all, ICCAs are an umbrella term. Uh, the CBD refers to indigenous and community conserved areas. That's where the ICCA comes from. IUCN is now using a longer phrase, indigenous peoples and community conserved territories and areas. Uh, both the CBD and IUCN are using this uh, acronym ICCAs. So it's an umbrella term for all the diverse ways in which indigenous peoples and local communities uh, carry out conservation on their territories, either deliberately as in a dedicated protected area or as a result 
of doing other kinds of things with other purposes that have conservation uh, significance, like uh, collectively managing livelihood commons for forest use or grazing, where sustainable use might be the goal, but conservation may be an outcome. The same with the protection of and care of sacred places. So we really have different kinds of ICCAs. Some of them are indigenous peoples protected areas, community protected areas. Some of them are collectively managed commons. Some of them are sacred places or other cultural sites that have conservation significance. So I also want to take a couple minutes here to talk about the principles of the new paradigm as I infer them from all of the IUCN policy over recent years. So this is my reading. So first of all, free prior and informed consent. That indigenous peoples must give free prior and informed consent to any protected areas established in their territories. And beyond this, they should be central in developing the design, goals, boundaries, governance structures, and management practices for protected areas. Second, that protected areas should continue to be self-governing homelands. And this requires recognition of indigenous peoples' ownership or custodianship of their territories, lands, and resources, including recognition of collective tenure. Moreover, it requires respect for their self-governance through their own institutions and practices, for continuing livelihood use of resources, and for indigenous peoples directing their own development and not being restricted in protected areas to traditional ways of life and resource use. Third, the new paradigm emphasizes affirmation of the rights and responsibilities, including those articulated in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. IUCN is very clear with multiple recommendations and resolutions that the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is taken as the minimum standard for rights recognition for Indigenous Peoples. The CBD has not yet been clear on that, and that's one of the major uh, gaps between them. Fourth, that protected area conservation policies and practices must respect, support, and take as their foundation indigenous peoples and local communities, values, institutions, and practices. And fifth, the indigenous peoples must participate fully and effectively in the governance of protected areas. And the whole discourse in protected areas has shifted away from management, the specific things that need to be done on the ground to governance, to who makes the decisions and how they're made. And finally, that indigenous peoples must share equitably in a full range of benefits from indigenous, uh, sorry, from protected areas. So this kind of shift in thinking has led to new kinds of protected areas being established. You're familiar with some of these in Canada. Uh, there have been intensified efforts in some countries since Durban to create and to reform protected areas in ways that embody new paradigm principles. Certain kinds of protected areas have been particularly emphasized. One of these is protected areas that have co-management or shared governance, as IUCN would call it now, shared governance. And the term that's coming into use now is co-governance to try to emphasize that this is different from co-management or joint management in that the governance, the, the decision-making power is really shared. So here you see on the left a famous Haida First Nation leader whom many of you may know, meeting with uh, Canadian federal officials to mark agreement on co-management of a new marine conservation area reserve and Haida heritage site. And on the right, a photo of a celebration of 20 years of co-governance of Guayanas Heritage Site and National Park Reserve. And one of the things that's interesting about this is in both cases, these are dual status protected areas. Yes, they're federally designated protected areas, but they're also Haida heritage sites. They're also Haida declared protected areas. We're also now seeing co-governed protected areas at multiple scales in British Columbia. There are now not only protected areas co-governed by indigenous peoples and the federal government, but also protected areas in which provincial governments are partners. The British Columbia conservancies are a notable case. The first established just in 2006, now 156 conservancies in British Columbia, constituting 21% of the area that's in provincial parks in British Columbia. At the bottom of the slide in the fine print, you can see that the objectives of the conservancies include the preservation and maintenance of social, ceremonial, and cultural uses of First Nations. There are now 11 conservancies in uh, Haida Gwaii. Uh, all of them 
following earlier declarations by the Haida of those areas as protected areas. So they're now both Haida heritage sites and co-governed conservancies. So I thought I'd put this in to uh, give a sense of uh, some of the dynamics in co-governance. I mean, we're seeing a number of countries come forward with sort of con conditional co-governance. Uh, yes, we'll uh, change the governance of a protected area if you've won a court case that says that the land will be restored to you on the condition, will restore the land on the condition that it be co-governed, South Africa, Australia. But there are also cases where indigenous peoples are requesting the establishment of co-governed protected areas. This is one of them from the Colombian Amazon in which a number of different indigenous peoples already had an indigenous reserve. So they already had legal title to their land, they had self-governance, but they decided to propose that the place also become a protected area, a national park, even though it meant that they would now have to co-govern the national park with the federal government of Colombia. And the, the impetus for this was threats from extractive industries, and in particular, mining companies, and in particular, Canadian mining companies. Um, this is a story in a lot of parts of the world now where indigenous peoples may have uh, collective ownership recognition to surface land but not to subsurface resources. So uh, this is a major problem. And uh, one of the outcomes from this that's encouraging is just last month, the Colombian Supreme Court found that in fact in a national park, uh, that you can't have mining and that the existing mining claims can't continue to be worked and that the Canadian company is going to have to shut down its operations. Um, another aspect of this is that uh, indigenous researchers are now working on a plan and a coordination plan. So plan for the territory first and then second a management plan for the national park that draws on the indigenous people's plan for the territory. This has happened in several other countries in South America as well. So there's been a lot of experience now with a co-governance, uh, some good and some not so good. And I've listed here some of the things that indigenous peoples often complain about when co-governance has not gone well. In some cases, it's not gone well so far, uh, and it's only been underway for a few years, and people are establishing working relationships, and maybe things will change. But if you look at the kinds of things I've listed here, you can see that there are some major structural impediments to real sharing of power and recognition of fundamental differences in life experience and values and aspirations for conservation and development in a territory. So there are going to be real challenges with making co-governance work effectively in many countries. So there's a lot of interest in a different approach, which is protected areas governed by indigenous peoples and local communities. And we're beginning to get more examples of these. Uh, indigenous peoples protected areas, community protected areas established by indigenous peoples and local communities on their own territories. This newspaper story celebrates the 2002 declaration in Australia of what became the largest terrestrial protected area in Australia. And the sign that's being, the sign that's being held up, if you can't read it, says, Southern Tanami Indigenous Protected Area managed to world conservation standards by the Aboriginal landowners and the Walpiri Rangers, Indigenous Rangers, with support from the Central Land Council. In Australia, since the late 1990s, a large set of Indigenous protected areas has been declared. These now encompass 40% of the Australia protected area system extend and they extend across an area that's double the entire size of the US national park system all established since the middle 1990s at least 20 more indigenous protected areas are in development so these are self declared self managed protected areas that have some degree of recognition and support from the Australian government they're being widely celebrated as having helped 
indigenous peoples return to country, including people who are returning to rural areas from which they've migrated. They helped revive management practices, such as the use of fire. They've increased intergenerational transmission of knowledge. They strengthened conservation and ecological restoration. And they created jobs and business opportunities in rural areas, including in ecological restoration work. So there are also indigenous or community protected areas in several countries in Africa. I know you're going to be hearing about these in the coming days. The communal conservancies of Namibia are notable because like the Australia indigenous protected areas, they're recognized by the central government as part of the protected area network. And there were, as of last year, 82 of these inhabited by 175,000 people covering half of community land and nearly a fifth of the total area of the country. There are also indigenous people's conservation areas in the Pacific with more than 500 locally managed marine areas now declared in 15 countries. These kind of locally managed marine areas are also being declared in parts of East Africa now and in Madagascar. There are also indigenous people's protected areas in the United States. There are tribal parks and there have been for a while. Um, the Navajo Nation began establishing tribal parks in 1958 with this Monument Valley Tribal Park. Other tribes have established tribal parks and wilderness areas since then. So these are self-initiated, self-governed, protected areas on reservations. There's been talk of the first tribal national park in the United States, and this is an initiative to restore Lakota self-governance of part of their homeland that's been incorporated into Badlands National Park. The National Park Service has approved this as its preferred alt management alternative for the future of Badlands National Park, the southern part of it. The tribe continues to discuss it, and there are some real issues over grazing leases especially. There's also the issue of whether or not Congress would have to approve the so-called handing over of governance authority to an indigenous people, which has never happened with a national park in the United States before. So it is not a done deal, even though the director of national parks in the US is in favor of this, it's a long way still from happening. And then there are tribal parks in Canada. So as many of you may know, the Colloquiat on Vancouver Island established their first tribal park in 1984 to prevent the logging of a sacred forest. Since 2007, the Colloquiat have declared all of the rest of their customary territories to be several different tribal parks and have established a zoning system for them. In the most recent case, they declared an area tribal park in part to stave off an unwanted mine. So these are sovereignty assertions over land whose indigenous ownership is not yet recognized by Canada. Here's another one, the Chilcotin First Nation. Uh, last year declared part of their customary territory to be a tribal park. This was not the part of the customary territory that figured in that Supreme Court decision on Aboriginal title. This is in another area, and it includes areas with significant mining claims and sacred places. There are also examples of strong initiatives by indigenous peoples to create protected areas and to gain their national recognition that have not yet uh, achieved their hope for results. One of them is from Guyana, the Wapichan people. So in this case, in 2012, after five years of extensive community meetings and 11 years of indigenous mapping projects, a group of 20 villages working together for the first time came together with a territorial plan, which they called Thinking Together for Those Coming Behind Us. As part of this planning process, there were a large number of community agreements and inter-community agreements, the first of their kind ever, about forests, to establish conserved forests, to declare half of the entire Wapichan customary territory a conserved forest in ICCA. These Maps and plans, though, you have to understand, are part of what's now a 40-year effort by the Wapichan to get recognition of their customary territories. And there's some urgency to this now because pressure from mining and industrial logging are threatening their territory. They hope by having this planning and mapping process to get recognition of tenure over their territories and stop extractive in industrial invasion, 
but the government of Guyana so far has been ignoring them. Here's another example of something that didn't go quite the way we'd hoped it would be. This is from the Mount Everest area where I work, the Sharwa or Sherpa people in Sagarmatha, Mount Everest National Park and World Heritage Site. So this is a customary Sherpa territory or Sharwa territory. Mount Everest is that pyramid-shaped mountain on the back left there at the Foot here is the largest of the Sharwa villages inside the national park. So the houses and the fields right around them are not part of the national park. Technically, they're an enclave of private land. It's considered part of the buffer zone. Everything else in that photo is national park land. Everything else in that photo was nationalized in the 1950s and 60s in people's lifetimes. And... Um, the National Park declared, the, uh, the government, central government took governance control over the area, all the customary local institutions ceased to be legal, although most of them continued to be carried on. And everything in that photo continues to be governed by the communities. The collectively owned, even though collective ownership isn't recognized by the state, the communities recognize collective ownership and responsibility for stewardship of collective, customary collective lands. The collectively governed forests, the collectively governed rangelands, grazing lands, the sacred places, the sacred mountains, the sacred lakes, springs, forests, trees, rocks, boulders, and the entire area is considered to be sacred, a sacred valley, so that the Sharwa people have um, self-dedicated themselves for centuries now to the protection of this area as a sacred valley in which no wildlife are killed. So there's no hunting, uh, there's no killing of domestic livestock now within this valley. So in 2008, uh, concerned as they have been for a long time that their land uh, tenure was not being recognized and their customary institutions weren't being recognized and there wasn't good respect and coordination between the state-governed National Park World Heritage Site and the communities, Shara leaders decided after having attended some workshops in Kathmandu in which ICCAs were discussed that uh, I remember them coming out of the meeting and saying, we have an ICCA, our whole territory is an ICCA, and we want to declare it to be an ICCA. And they decided to go ahead with that, and they had a community meeting, self-declared it as an ICCA, made very clear that they weren't uh, undermining the existence of the national park, that they wanted a dual designation. They wanted to be respected as self-governing their territory and contributing to the conservation achievements of the national park. People would say, we are responsible for 80% of the conservation success of the national park. The national park is largely on paper. What's happening with conservation on the ground is being done by the communities. So they did that, and this led to them being charged with having held illegal meetings and uh, carrying out illegal actions and being forced to retract their declaration, being ordered to give a public apology, which they refused to give, and the leader said, send us to jail instead. Uh, they um, ran into a major national controversy uh, about sovereignty and, and rights. And uh, the conflict was toned down a little bit, but the tension is still there, and the Sharwa are continuing to try to work with the government to educate government officials. When things were at the height of the crisis, 18 Sharwa leaders from all of the regional NGOs sent a letter to the Director General of National Parks telling him that if he continued to misrepresent who they are and what they want in the national press, that they would be forced to take educational actions, implying strikes and so forth during tourist season. And that helped diffuse the situation. The, the Director General of National Parks gave no more interviews to the press after that. But at the same time, there was, on, there was behind the scenes discussions going on between the ICCA Consortium and IUCN and the National Park Department as well, trying to remind Nepal about international policies and standards. Um, so. Here is a positive example of the same sort of thing, of an overlay of a protected area over indigenous people's territory where indigenous peoples continue 
to carry out conservation in their territory and where they want recognition of this. And this is in the Philippines, uh, basically the equivalent of a national park, a category two natural park, overlapping with six people's indigenous territories, including the sacred forest shown the lower left. The people who had the sacred forest wanted their authority over the sacred forest recognized in order to protect it from tourism and from potential mining threats. And they campaigned for this. And they did it in a different way from what the Sherpas did in the Everest area. And they got a pilot Jeff SGP project. They did mapping and documentation. They got a listing in the UN Environmental Program's new global ICCA registry. And they got recognition of their self-governance of this as a zone within the national park in the management plan of the park, which is co-governed. So a, a totally different outcome, but also a different situation with a co-governed protected area. So what we're seeing now is that uh, indigenous peoples are very aware that there's a widespread and serious implementation gap. That uh, we have international policies uh, have been adopted, which are pretty progressive, but there's a problem with implementation on the ground. And this implementation gap is between different countries. It's also between different protected areas and kinds of protected areas in a single country. Sometimes there'll be one or two protected areas where as a result of, of an indigenous people's campaign and, and a long period of struggle, there's been a change uh, and a reform, but this didn't apply all across the system. It was a single case and usually governments try to make very clear that no precedent is being set. So this brings us to the World Parks Congress. Last autumn in Sydney, Australia, I know some of you were there. And it was pretty striking the difference in tone because this was the first World Parks Congress since the one in Durban in 2003 where indigenous peoples came and confronted conservationists. Instead, we had on the first day of this World Parks Congress, the president of IUCN, uh, Zhang Xinsheng coming up on stage and giving uh, opening remarks in which he highlights the importance of indigenous peoples to global conservation and saying, remembering and recalling Durban and saying, we established at Durban a new paradigm. We ushered in a new era of respect for the rights of indigenous and local communities linked to their responsibility as custodians. So the World Parks Congress was a big event. 6,000 people, 170 countries. So people come back with very different impressions from what happened at Sydney. I may have said Durban, but at Sydney. I was particularly involved with two of the eight streams of workshops. Stream six, which the ICCA consortium helped organize on the diversity and quality of governance, and stream seven on respecting indigenous and traditional knowledge and culture. So my impressions of the Sydney World Parks Congress are based on being in these groups over the time we spent in Sydney and my reading of the Promise of Sydney, the outcome document from the meeting. And the promise of Sydney is, is different from earlier World Parks Congress in that it has a very short vision statement, a page and a half. And then it has many recommendations from the different workshop which have been posted online. In the vision statement, there are some pretty significant statements like this one here in which some of the key phrases recognizing traditions and knowledge rights and responsibilities, we will seek to redress and remedy past and continuing injustices in accord with international agreement. Um, the recognition is there that the, the principles and promises really that were made in Durban haven't been fully realized and that there needs to be a renewed effort to do this, to implement them. Other encouraging signs were in the preamble, again, acknowledging the increasing role of indigenous peoples conserved areas and territories in reaching biodiversity conservation and societal goals and enhancing diversity, quality, and vitality and governance and management of protected areas, including appropriate recognition and support of areas conserved by indigenous peoples. This is ICCAs again. ICCAs were very visible and prominent at Sydney. So some of the encouraging signs, I would say, were first, the presence and voice of indigenous peoples was prominent. It was welcomed to a degree it has never been at a World Parks Congress before. Second, there was a strong focus on the urgency of better implementing the new paradigm, and several mechanisms for doing so were advanced. I'm showing you a whole number of here. I'm going to just highlight a couple of them. 
And finally, there was a strong emphasis on improving protected area governance, stressing governance by indigenous peoples and shared governance. So the couple of things I'm gonna highlight were first of all, the launch of the Wakatani mechanism. This is IUCN's attempt to begin to engage in conflict resolution in which it stands up for the principles that it has adopted. So the idea is, and it's now been piloted, and as you can see at the bottom, in four countries, and now they've launched it. They're looking for the funding to upscale this and to have many more of these kind of interventions. What happens is that IUCN will have a mechanism to respond to requests from indigenous peoples reporting that they have a conflict situation. It will then try to mediate. It'll try to send a team that draws on local and regional IUCN offices, but also on concerned NGOs like Forest People's Program, which is very heavily involved in this. And it will try to sit down at a round table with indigenous peoples, government officials, and others, and first of all, talk about the situation. Sometimes it's the first time that government officials have sought, sat down with indigenous peoples, but then what comes next is innovative because then they go to the territory together, and they spend some time there looking at the problems with the indigenous peoples, and now the government officials are out in the field with indigenous peoples, with IUCN, there as well. Then they go back to the table again. And the idea of the third trip, the second trip back to the table is to try to put together a roadmap to address some of the issues. Um, the flaw in this process is that this is a one-time event and there's been discussion of how there needs to be monitoring and follow-up with this as well. Another thing that was important from Sydney that many people may not have picked up on is that the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was at one of these meetings for the first time, Vicky Taholi Corpus. And uh, she was there for the whole meeting and she participated strongly in the meeting and she said some important things. One is she said that the recommendations in the Durban uh, Action Plan actually are a very good basis for reforming protected areas, but that they need to be implemented. She said that voluntary codes by conservation organizations aren't enough and there need to be accountability and monitoring mechanisms. And she promised that she would stay more engaged with this issue and that she would do a thematic report on indigenous peoples and conservation or specifically on indigenous peoples and protected areas. This is huge because UN Special Rapporteurs and the Rights of Indigenous Peoples do country reports and they do thematic reports. There hasn't been one on conservation or on protected areas. This will raise these issues to a much higher degree of visibility within the UN human rights monitoring community. And at a meeting I was at a couple weeks ago, she also pledged to try to involve all the UN Special Rapporteurs, making them aware of issues concerned with conservation and protected areas so that they can also keep an eye on these kind of situations while carrying out their mandates. And one other development I wanna highlight was specifically concerned with ICCAs, and that was a pledge by the German government to do more in support of ICCAs. So the German government, a couple of years ago, uh, pledged to provide $16 million in support for ICCA-related work. And as a result, in 2003, a global ICCA support initiative was formed. And this is the ICCA consortium with uh, the Global Environment Facility UN Development Program, Small Grants Program, with the UN Environment Programs and the World Conservation Monitoring Center's Global ICCA Registry, a, a list of ICCAs. Uh, and the IUCN Global Protected Area Program, which is going to get more involved in doing protected area governance assessments, which can include the status of ICCAs in existing protected areas. So the initial commitment by the German government was $16 million. They announced it at the last conference of the parties of the CBD, and they had press releases and everything else. At Sydney, uh, governments and conservation organizations were encouraged to make pledges, pledges of financial support, pledges of specific actions in support of the vision and the promise from Sydney. And to somewhat to our surprise, because this had not been discussed prior to that, the German government decided that it wanted to up its commitments to protected area governance in general, but to ICCAs in particular. So they raised the $16 million that they had already provided us to $100 million yeah, over 10 years. So there's now significantly more funding. Now a small part of that goes to the ICCA consortium for its operations and for its advising work with UN Development Program and with the UN Environment Program. But almost all of the money is going to go to the Jeff uh, 
UNDP small grants program for grants that go directly to indigenous peoples and local communities to do ICCA related work. And the ICCA consortium will be involved in the, the meetings within the countries with the national committees to try to raise awareness of what are and aren't ICCAs because there's a concern that now that there's money on the table, everybody's gonna come forward saying that we're an ICCA and can we have our share of the grant money. Uh, but there's gonna be an educational process, but there's also gonna be the opportunity for much more research documentation of ICCAs and work community activism in support of ICCAs by communities made possible by this funding. So I haven't said anything about the ICCA consortium and you know we decided in 2008 to form the ICCA consortium in the hopes of being able to do something outside of IUCN and draw on different funding and do different kinds of things that IUCN wasn't able to do. And it's really more of a movement than an organization. It's an alliance of indigenous peoples, local communities, indigenous peoples organizations, community organizations, and NGOs that support ICCA-related work, working at all kinds of levels, grassroots, national, international, regional, and global in the policy arena. And we have partnerships and working agreements, particularly with the Secretary of the Secretary of the CBD and with IUCN and UNDP and U and EP. So I, I've now come to the final few words. And uh, I want to say something about research, advocacy, and activism. I want to start out with advocacy and activism, and I want to stress a couple of points. First of all, there is more need for international advocacy. I already mentioned how the CBD has not fully engaged with all of the principles that are already embodied in IUCN policies, and there's political reasons for that, and it's going to be a long road ahead to achieve that, but there's work that needs to be done, right? But the big thing that needs to be done at this point is at the national level. The role for advocacy at the national level is huge because of that implementation gap. And that this has to happen at all levels. In some countries, it requires constitutional reform efforts. In some, it requires national law and administrative rules, national policies and plans. And oftentimes, it requires changing institutional cultures within the agencies that have been involved with protected areas. There's also a need for advocacy at local level to raise awareness of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the policies that have been adopted by IUCN and the, and the CBD decisions that pertain to rights and protected areas. In terms of activism, I want to first stress community activism because I think that the key thing here is the crucial work that has to be done to keep alive the knowledge, the values, the livelihood and management institutions and practices that have been the basis of indigenous people's stewardship of their territories. In a lot of parts of the world, this is really being severely challenged. And it's our hope that the German money through a UNDP small grant program will go to a lot of these kind of projects for strengthening ICCAs. There's also a major need for doing new kinds of things, the kind of thing the Wapichan have been doing. Uh, meeting with communities and developing regional territorial plans, uh, putting in place monitoring and assessment, and raising the awareness of what your conservation achievements have been. But there's also a role for multi-scale collaborative advocacy and activism, and here reforming protected areas as well as advocating new ones, and there's so much that needs to be done in terms of the priorities. I know many of you here in the room are working on various projects that directly pertain to these kinds of priorities. And as you know, there's also a role for multiple strategies and tactics. And I think we're you know, finding in a lot of countries that awareness raising isn't enough, at least unless you're prepared to wait for several more generations. And that there have to be direct engagements on the ground in emergency situations for blockades and campaigns to stop things that are happening now and delay what's happening now long enough to try to mount larger campaigns and movements that change, change people's minds but also change laws and policies. So there's a, a big role for, uh, for all of these things, including legal action and, in, and teaching the tools that enable these things to be done. So research is critical for both those things, for the advocacy for the policies and the legal change and for the activism on the ground and at different scales. 
And what I want to highlight here is it's really important that we have more research on the protected areas, including especially what seem at least superficially from the outside to be good examples or things that have good practices. And it may not turn out that way when you get to looking at them more closely, but this is really important for a number of different reasons. It's important to celebrate uh, the achievements that have been made and raise awareness of them. In many places, this is really inspiring for people in other countries to hear about these examples, but also it gives government officials and conservation, people who work for conservation organizations some sense that something else is possible. And you'd be surprised how often people are glued into their situation and don't realize the great things that are happening in other countries. Another thing is to create more credibility. Academic research, research done collaboratively in partnerships in indigenous peoples, research can all uh, help establish credibility for the profound achievements indigenous peoples have had in conservation that is important to make because we still have to get through to people who are making decision making at central government and international levels and more documentation is going to be critical for that. So as you can see, there are many different kinds of projects that can be done. And um, I think many of you, we're going to be hearing about a lot of these things in the coming days. But what I encourage you to do is, those of you who are working with indigenous peoples, uh, to sometimes uh, if they're still inhabited protected areas in the country you're working in, to try to begin to do research on the situations in those protected areas and not just in the buffer zones. And then this is sort of my, my final message, is that I hope you can find ways to support indigenous research. Um, that's what we're trying to do through the Jeff SGP projects, right? And in some countries that may work and in some other countries that may not work, so much has to do with the national committees and what they will and will not fund. When the Sherpas came in with their proposal, which has now been funded, and said we want to have community meetings, we want to do a regional plan, they were told informally, yes, 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 but we don't want to fund community meetings. Do something concrete, put up fences was the first suggestion, fences and signs. And so uh, they've tried to negotiate some compromise where they can do a little bit of that and a lot of other things. Yeah, but the second thing, though, is to make use of your connections to fund indigenous research. And this is the role for large collaborative projects where you try to make space in those large collaborative projects for research initiated by indigenous peoples, carried out by indigenous peoples, uh, with the funding from the academic or the non-academic uh, funding agencies. And then the second thing is to respond to requests. And in order to do that, you have to have the long-term relationships with the indigenous peoples and communities. You have to talk with people before you write the grant proposals. You have to try to get their priorities into the thinking that informs the proposals and ideally write the proposals together, right? But to respond to requests, to use research as an as a agent of change. So this just brings me to my conclusion. So I'd say while an important beginning has been made by envisioning a new paradigm of protected areas and integrating it into international policy, there remains the great challenge of having this incorporated into national law and practice worldwide. In many countries, this is going to require a multi-generational struggle. It's going to be as big as trying to implement the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, but what has been accomplished already is remarkable if you compare the situation today with the situation 10 or 20 years ago in which the taken for granted conventional wisdom didn't imagine protected areas governed by indigenous peoples or co-governance arrangements and it didn't imagine protected areas based on different understandings of what conservation might be that weren't as ethnocentric as the ones that have driven international policy so much. So there is now a new vision of protected areas. This has become central to international policies and guidance, which is no small thing in itself. And there are new kinds of protected areas that are not only being imagined, but are being realized on the ground. So there are important precedents being established and experience being gained. In the past few years, we've begun to move from protected areas being major threats to indigenous peoples, territories, ways of life, and existence as peoples, 
to protect the areas becoming opportunities and means to realize recognition of territory and tenure, restitution of territory, affirmation of rights, self-governance, and conservation through stewardship of territory. I know that many of you are working on these kind of issues now. I encourage the rest of you to get involved with it. There's a lot of work to do and kind of a long struggle ahead, but I think a lot has already been accomplished and there's a lot of prospects to go a lot farther with it in coming years. So thank you very much.